Have you ever had trouble seeing a doctor? Well, it's a global issue, with the WHO estimating the deficit of healthcare professionals to be in the millions. To solve this problem, some countries have come up with plans to expand or offer alternatives to medical universities. But not all doctors are happy about this. So for those lucky enough to have access to healthcare, what is really going on? And is our health in safe hands? I'm Miriam Francois, and this is The Stream. By 2050, the world's population of people aged 60 and over will double and will bring with it double burdens to national health systems. As our healthcare needs increase, governments are trying to find ways to address this looming crisis. In South Korea, the government has proposed increasing the enrollment cap, and the UK has introduced a plan for a paid apprenticeship that would result in the same qualification as traditional medical schools. Controversial? Many young doctors certainly think so. Joining us to discuss this are doctors from across the world. Dr. Alice Tan, an internal medicine specialist, joining us from Seoul. And Nairobi, Kenya, is Dr. Davji Bimji Atullah from National Secretary General and CEO of the Kenya Medical Practitioners Pharmacists and Dentists Union. And Dr. Habib Rahman, a cardiology registrar, joining us from London. Welcome to you all. Now, this is a global problem with multiple routes to it. So what is going on? I spoke with Dr. Lujain al qudmani president of the World Medical Association, about the state of healthcare. The world today is still missing around 10 million healthcare professionals. But did you know that at the same time, there is a growing unemployment rate among young physicians and other health professionals due to fragile healthcare systems? So the problem is not just we are missing the number of physicians and we need to have more and more medical students who graduate from medical schools. We really need to address the root causes in the healthcare systems. And as I said before, is the having a, um, a safe working environment, having policies that protect the um, safety of healthcare professionals, providing them what they need with the development opportunities, having an equal fair pay. So all of these factors needs to be considered. It's not just about let's just increase the number and let's have more and more doctors and an already weak, unsustainable and fragile healthcare system. Dr. Habib Rahman, a junior doctors in the UK are striking for the 10th time in their ongoing dispute with the government. What is going on in the UK? Well, I, I would say um, it's best framed as a, a, a broader a struggle for democracy in the UK, really. Uh, that, that's the best way in which I think it, it should be framed. Um, doctors are workers too. And um, there has been increasing uh, democratic action uh, from workers all over the UK from various different sectors, and we just happen to be one of them. And, and what exactly are the grounds of the dispute? Give us a sense for those who are unfamiliar with the situation in the UK. Well, si since the mid-2000s, we've had a, a, a freeze in our pay, which, uh, as everyone knows, a pay freeze is simply a code word for a pay cut because it means that your pay is not matched to inflation. So the suggestion that we're actually asking for a pay rise is kind of a misconstrual of the whole, the, 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 the facts of the matter. We're simply asking for our pay to be restored to what it was back in the mid-2000s. Hmm. And to try and address the need for more doctors, the UK government has introduced alternative pathways into the profession. Check this out. In the future, we're going to have doctors who have done the apprenticeship and doctors who have gone to university to study medicine the traditional way. And the doctors who have gone to medical school the traditional way will have debts and student loans to pay back, whilst the doctors that have gone through the apprenticeship route will be debt free. Why would anyone still want to do the traditional medical degree in the future if they can do the apprenticeship degree? As a current medical student, I'm beginning to question my life decisions because did I go to medical school too early? I could have waited a couple of years and done it for free. Apparently, the aim of the course is to widen access and participation and to make medicine more diverse. But the practicalities of the course is so controversial and raises so many questions. 
Dr. Habib, off the back of what we've just seen, do you have any specific concerns about some of the changes being proposed by the government in terms of both, obviously, the situation for doctors, but also the care that patients might be receiving? Well, once again, there's an, uh, the, 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 the key element here is from whence are these decisions arising? It's certainly not coming from the medical profession and it's not coming from the British people. These decisions are being made by politicians and careerists. You know, there, there, there's always going to be a coterie of careerists, you know, often with uh, academic interests who, um, who decide that in actual fact it's perfectly okay to undercut a profession that has, has been there to serve the British people for centuries. The, the core issue, I would say, is why is it the doctors don't get to have a say in any of this? Mm. Well, I'm sure that's something that, yes, I see your, your fellow panellists nodding there. Well, it seems like there is a general sense of doctors not feeling like their work is being valued. Um, Dr. Bella says, I'm a doctor and I'm living in a house with a leaking roof, a kitchen with no radiator and a bathroom, which is basically an outdoor shed. And I can't afford to live anywhere else. Don't tell me I'm greedy. She is a British doctor. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, Dr. Atala, is this an issue that Kenyan doctors might also recognize? Yes, actually, there's the same scenario in the Kenyan context, in the sense that we realize that uh, we have uh, the new graduates, which are interns, who need to be posted for their internship. And in the government decided to reduce the salaries by 91% without any consultation. And this was contravening an existing collective bargaining agreement that we signed with the government in 2017. And therefore, we realized that there's no any other doctor or any consultant who will be safe. And that was the genesis of the industrial action that commenced on the 13th of this month. Yes, yeah, so I was seeing you're, you're back to striking after what was a 100-day strike, right, back in 2017. So give us a sense of how much or maybe how little has changed for you within the profession. Yeah, the, 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 the reason for the 100-day uh, strike that commenced in December 2016 and ended in March uh, 2017 was for the uh, government to accept having a collective bargaining agreement with uh, the doctors. And particularly, it was for a pay rise that was, required, that was required at that time. But then seven years later, the government has not implemented the agreement, particularly the basic salary component of this particular CBA up to date. So uh, we have been having conversations and engagement, but still they did not implement it. Instead, they have come into a uh, freeze or reduce the uh, benefits that you already had in that collective bargaining agreement. And therefore, there's not much that has improved. In fact, for the, for the, for the years that uh, we have seen, uh, there are about six years now, uh, the automatic employment of doctors to different uh, public facilities are reduced. So yes, we have a shortage of about 50,000 doctors that need to be employed. At the same time, we have about 4,000 unemployed. So our action currently with the demonstrations we are doing with the strike that we are on is to demand that the government must employ uh, the unemployed doctors. At the same time, uh, the government must uh, not uh, unilaterally reduce the wages that have been have been bargained in collective bargaining agreement. So today is the day 13 of the total uh, shutdown of all the public hospitals in the country. Uh, but we've been having engagement with government regarding that. So we said uh, we may not need to go to 100 days, but we will not uh, allow uh, the interference with already existing collective bargaining agreement. We need to get the wages better they to factor in the inflation instead of them being retrogressive as the government proposed proposing. Mm. Well, pay is clearly central to this. This TikTok, this TikTok seems to capture the mood among some physicians in Kenya right now. Dr. Atala, I want to ask you off the back of that, uh, obviously humour to tell, make an important point there, but what are some of the challenges which these doctor shortages pose to patient care for you and your colleagues? Uh, one thing is that uh, the waiting time for the patients in the public hospitals uh, takes quite long. It's up about 12 to 24 hours. So therefore, it becomes very difficult to, for, the, for the public to access the care as expected. So that's one of the big issues. 
Then secondly, we have the hospitals where a doctor exists, but then they're not supported with the, requirement, the, with the required reagents or the, uh, the, the the medicines that will actually uh, enable uh, service provision. So most, so we believe that uh, when we sign the CBA, that then the doctors will be offering services when they're supported, not just being in the hospitals to supervise the deaths. But then uh, we realize that for government to do a better budget or to allocate enough funds for uh, service for healthcare itself, we actually have to do something. We have to make, we have to mostly force them to do it because we have seen the budget has been actually going down every year. And you see in Kenya, uh, healthcare is almost like a devolved. We have one government, yes, but we have almost 47 counties that each, each one of them manage healthcare differently. So we are trying to uh, uh, push the government to actually look for a, a national standard in management of healthcare. Hmm. Dr. Alastan, I want to bring you in now. Are wages part of the issue why doctors are striking in South Korea right now? Uh, wages are part of the issue. But another major issue is, as you mentioned, South Korean government has decided to increase the medical school admission quota by 2,000 students, which is almost a 70% increase in the number of medical school students who would be admitted. Uh, and the timeline for this is uh, to get this implemented in less than one year. And many people in the medical community here in South Korea, we acknowledge that there is a physician shortage in our country, but simply raising the admission quota by 2000 does not address uh, some very important issues. Namely, there is a huge discrepancy in physician density in our country. So in the capital region, uh, there really isn't a physician def deficiency. There's no shortage in the capital region. The physician density is uh, 3.1 to 3.5 per 1,000 people. However, when we go into the rural uh, and remote areas of South Korea, the physician density drops down to 1.9 per 1,000 uh, people, which indicates a shortage of doctors. But simply saying having 2,000 more um, medical school students and therefore 2,000 more uh, graduates does not necessarily mean that they will be going into the regions where we are experiencing a shortage. Also, our uh, our viewers should be aware that when we say doctor, we're talking a very about a heterogeneous profession. So um, you could have pediatricians, ob gyne doctors, geriatricians, surgeons, physicians, people in primary care. It's a very mixed bag of, of specialties. Here in South Korea, there are certain specialties where uh, trainees are deciding they're just not going to pursue anymore. For example, um, pediatrics. Um, there, there's a big shortage in pediatric trainees in South Korea. Um, we've had a shortage of cardiothoracic uh, doctors going into training programs, ob uh, And so likewise, having 2,000 more um, medical school students doesn't guarantee that these students, once they graduate, will go into the fields where we are experiencing shortages. And so um, we're very concerned about this uh, move of the government. And also, um, not only will it not address our problems, it could actually make the medical and training uh, infrastructure uh, and ecosystem worse. It, I mean, you can just imagine if we have 70% more students um, within a short amount of time, medical colleges simply cannot get ready in time to um, have this expanded pool of students. Um, most people will know, will be familiar with anatomy classes, I think, in medical school and just having seen that in movies and TV shows. I mean, having 70% um, more students uh, who need to have dissection classes, who need to look under the microscope for pathology, um, we just don't have the uh, teachers we don't have the space um, to accommodate this uh, increase. And then lastly, um, for 2024, there were uh, 3,163 residency positions altogether in our country. Uh, there were 3,385 candidates. In other words, there were 222 more candidates than there were positions uh, for residency. If we add 2,000 more 
candidates, um, that's just going to lead to a huge, huge surplus. Um, and it could really um, negatively impact the quality of medical care. Uh, in our country. And then lastly, the reason why the um, the young doctors right now is the doctors in training who are on strike. So 10,000 residents and interns are on strike. Uh, another reason why they are on strike or they've re resigned from their positions is because of the government's attitude uh, toward healthcare reform. They've been very obstinate. They've been very arrogant. Um, they've used authoritarian um, tactics. They've um, uh, subjected some doctors to 14-hour police interrogations. They've raided offices and homes of physicians. They threatened to suspend medical licenses of these 10,000 doctors in training. Um, they th also threatened jail time. So these kinds of tactics, of course, um, are not conducive to the open dialogue that we need, the collaborative uh, environment that we need to really tackle healthcare reform in our country. It's really just caused anger and a lot of disappointment among the young doctors. And so um, I, I think in a nutshell, that's what's going on in South Korea right now. Uh, the real problem though is not yeah. only do we have the 10 yeah. doctors in training, <clears throat> the professors are also be going on strike as well. So 2,000 senior attending physicians uh, have started to tender their re resignations as of this morning. Okay. Well, I mean, I think Dr. Atala might also uh, share some views concerning some of the uh, harsher tactics that protests or processes have been met by. Uh, you have your, your own story on this issue, I believe, Dr. Atala. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, I like what's happening in South Korea because it actually means they don't want to reduce the quality of care. And also the way the government is reacting to the, to them uh, here when we are having the demonstration and the protests to, to to render our petitions to different governments, I think on 29th of February, uh, the government uh, through the police actually targeted and shot my head uh, on the parental side. I think I had some epidural hematoma and also a cranial fracture. And this was because they were trying to shut down the uh, the changes that we were bringing, and they wanted to stop the, uh, the, the what you are uh, agitating for. But I think they came to realize that it's not really uh, me as the issue. It is the whole doctor fraternity, because uh, when they hit me on 29th, then uh, my deputy, who is an OBS guy, actually now gave a notice that there will be strike effective the next week. And I think uh, from uh, from there, from uh, 13th, then to date, there has not been any duty, any doctor on duty in the country. So I think uh, we have come to a point that we realize that we have to really fight for this change. We have to fight for this dignity. Otherwise, uh, this uh, as, as, aspect of intimidation will actually make them emboldened. Mm -hmm. uh, to now to the point that I think uh, last week on Thursday, we met with the head of public service. And tomorrow we are seeing the president himself coming on the table to have a discussion yeah. to know why we are agitating on these issues. Well, we have managed to also organize demonst uh, demonstrations in yeah. almost all cities in, the, in, in Kenya. Well, one of the challenges faced globally, uh, of course, is of the brain drain of doctors. Let's take a look at this. When you have a leadership that is very selfish and that does not care about the people, when you have people losing interest in their country, this is what happens, as you can see. So we, ha we are having a migration of doctors from Kenya to the West, to other countries in, in, in outside the country. So I'm aware that the issue of the brain drain of doctors affects many countries. Um, I want to first ask you, Dr. Uh, Habib Rahman, because the UK is the sixth wealthiest economy in the world and yet is struggling to retain some of its doctors. How is that happening? Well, uh, you know, to put it in a nutshell, it's because the medical workforce has been so undervalued by the um, by the British government for such a long time. Um, it's no surprise that uh, doctors who've worked for such a long time, both in the UK and elsewhere in the world, if, if they're given an offer to work elsewhere and get given a better deal, better working conditions, better pay, um, that they, they will leave. So they're... Uh, Plenty of doctors in the UK trained here, maybe even born and raised here, uh, who decide to leave for the US or for, uh, for, for North America, for Australasia. 
Mm. Um, and similarly, we, we see a brain drain occurring from uh, you know, African countries, um, uh, the Middle East, South Asia, uh, to the UK as well. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to pick up on that with you, Dr. Atala, because I understand that Kenya loses many doctors and nurses to the UK each year. And this is actually part of a government agreement, is it not? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think we have a, a, a government to government agreement with UK where there are a lot of nurses that have been leaving. Uh, I think for the last uh, the last two, three years, we were about 30 percent of the nursing population that rather in the country have left to UK. And I think majorly it's because of the wages, the better wages, and also the unemployment status that are there in the country. And as I said earlier, uh, before 2016, uh, the doctors were graduating and were immediately getting employed. But now there are a lot of frustrations that are coming up with the government because of the different austerity measures that are brought. You realize that you tend to have the salary delays, you tend to have to fight or go on strikes or promotions. You have to keep on, fo keep on following. So many of the specialist doctors are actually leaving for UK, most of them to UK and a few to US. But UK has been the, the destination for majority of them. And mostly, it's not the, uh, the junior doctors, it's mostly the ones who have really specialized that leave the country. So it's been, a, uh, it's been a thing of concern. I remember last year, government was trying to come up with a policy that will prevent doctors from migrating uh, to leave the country. Mm. But we ask the government that in case you can't employ them or give competitive uh, 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 wages or you don't honor the agreement, then somebody has no otherwise but to leave. Let's talk solutions. This guy has a proposal. What do we think? So what if I said there's a simple solution that will give doctors more money to take home and the government will not have to pay a single penny extra? Sounds amazing, right? We remove the tax from doctors. Now, if you don't tax doctors, doctors will go home with a bigger paycheck. And at the same time, the government doesn't have to pay an extra penny more. Now, yes, they will receive slightly less income, the government, because doctors aren't paying tax. But the money they are missing out on is still less than the money that they would have to lose from giving to more doctors. Dr. Rahman, could this be part of the solution? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, but the, the the reason why I think it's um, uh, unlikely to be uh, instituted is because, you know, we all know that this isn't a, an issue about money. There's plenty of money available. The government gives it away in cheap credit to big business all the time. Um, and, you know, it, 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 this is basically an issue of whether or not it wishes to give the British people uh, what they're asking for. Um, that's that's the the sticking point. They are digging the, the. It's not as I said earlier. It's not something that's just affecting the medical sector. It's affecting uh, so many sectors in the UK, not just the public sector. Dr. Alice Tan, I want to ask you about solutions. Of course, South South Korea is also facing an issue of aging population, which we heard about. I mean, how you know how is that meant to be addressed? Do you have proposals as doctors for how to try and address that looming problem? Right. So you asked about um, fees and the financial aspect of what's going on. So I think coming up with a rational, fair reimbursement scheme that incentivizes doctors to go into primary care so that we can take care of our increasing aging population makes sense. Right now, for example, pediatrics, um, there are no young doctors who want to become pediatricians because um, the, the amount of money that you uh, can make seeing one patient as a pediatric doctor uh, comes out to about $8 per patient. Um, and so it costs more to get your hair cut than for you to go and see your uh, doctor take your, your child to see a pediatrician in South Korea. It's really a shame. And so looking for a reimbursement scheme that makes sense, that encourages doctors to go into the primary care fields that will address our aging population, I think makes sense. And also dealing with the medical legal issues. Mm -hmm. um, we need tort law reform in South Korea so that doctors uh, are not facing huge financial risks when they pursue um, certain fields such as emergency medicine that have uh, high risks of, of um, medical legal uh, ramifications. Understood. Well, look, thank you so much to you all, um, Alice, Davish and Habib.
Um, and of course, thank you all for watching. If you have a comment about our show, talk to us on social media. And if you have a conversation that you would like to flag for us, this is also your show. Use the hashtag or the handle AJStream and we will look into it. Take care and I'll see you soon.